Welcome back to the panel discussion, Data-Driven Decision-Making in Government, sponsored by Vion Corporation, here on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. Our guests today are Richard Brakeiron, the Senior Director of Cyber Solutions at Vion Corporation. Duncan McCarthy is the Technical Executive at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's InnoVision Directorate. And Mark Elbert is the Director of the Office of Web Management at the Energy Information Administration. And uh, Duncan, I want to go to you now and talk about uh, how how the NGA is, what are the new ways that you are developing value out of the vast stores of data that you have, tools, I, techniques? I think this is really the exciting thing because uh, over the last 50 years, the NGA has been in the business of getting information from satellites, from images, and then handing those pictures to people to look at them. And uh, <clears throat> if I were to ana analogize to another industry, say like the jewelry making industry, um, that's that's become roughly the equivalent of if I want to make a diamond ring, I uh, I now take a cubic mile of dirt out of South Africa and say it's all in there. Analyst, go for it. You can find the gold. You can find the diamonds. Just start searching. Right. We don't want that anymore. Right. So what we want to do is is have our analysts instead of them being, you know, looking back and forth on a, in a tedious job looking at imagery have them be able to initially consume the results of what that imagery should tell them. And for that type of analysis, we need to develop the analytics that you were mentioning earlier, which are uh, fully distributed uh, programs which can plug into a modular architecture and look at that, at that imagery or video as it comes through. In order to do that, we need to take that imagery, which can be big, right? If I have, if I have a 20 gigabyte image, I can't process that on a single processor very well and have it, it churns for minutes or hours to, in order to come up with a, the, the result. So what I need to do is take that image, divide it into thousands of little pieces and send it out to many processors at the same time, making use of this MapReduce algorithm, which we've probably heard of. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we do that within a Hadoop framework. And I was so, going to say, Hadoop comes next, right? Exactly, yeah. right? We, we instantiate the MapReduce and Hadoop, and uh, we've extended some of these highly secure databases. Well, the one particular, um, Accumulo, we extended it to give Accumulo geospatial capability because most databases don't have that. But the way you describe that sounds as if you know what you're looking for to begin with. How does that help? How does that technology, that technique, help you get to the wild card that nobody saw coming, for example. Well, you develop, you begin to look for patterns of life in things. It's okay, this is this is the way this community tends to operate. You know, these are times when cars go down the road, these are times when they don't. And then you look for, you know, strange anomalies. Now, those strange anomalies may be something that's absolutely, you know, unsurprising, uh, um, maybe coming from, from an unsurprising reason, right? You know, traffic has stopped out on Wisconsin Avenue because today the president went by. Well, you know, these things happen. But but uh, in, in, at other times, well, you know, why is it that there's no traffic on that road? Well, maybe the locals know something that we don't, and uh, maybe we don't want to drive down that road for that reason. And the tools to do this, the analytical tools to do this, are they developed in-house? Are you buying commercial tools? Is it a service? How does that all work? Actually, this is really at the, at the very cutting edge of technology today. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, programs out there which can do essentially... Uh, uh, feature extraction from imagery or uh, develop an understanding of a video as it's played, but it's it's really still fairly basic. We've thrown a lot of money at that over uh, throughout the Defense Department for the last 30 years, and we went through kind of a dark ages where people believed it just couldn't occur. Um, but now we're beginning to see that it can occur. Um, there's uh, video analysis algorithms out there which can tell you what your video is about, or maybe even summarize, give you a text summary from the video. And we're going to try to leverage those capabilities to develop these analytics in the future. And do they require human feedback into the algorithm such that they develop greater accuracy over time? Initially, we're, we use um, fully supervised things like you're talking about, um, but we're trying to develop learning algorithms, making use of things like IBM's Watson to try to, to do uh, not un what they call unsupervised learning. So we should try to learn the way a baby learns, right? You know, you, you're not telling, well, maybe you do tell the baby, you know, this is the bottle many times in a row. But over time, the baby begins to recognize the bottle or other bottles in the environment just from many, many repetitions of, of similar things. And I guess the other question, and then we'll keep moving here, though, is w w what domains can this technique cover? Because uh, you have uh, you know, a, a military and intelligence mm -hmm. 
domain ultimately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Mark has an energy domain, mm-hmm. and can any of these tools be cross domain, which really gives you a bigger and bigger picture over time? I would think when we develop the capabilities to for a computer to be able to parse the imagery it's getting from its environment, there's all sorts of uh, industries that open up. Um, you, know, you could you could have a, a robot at home that can really do some science fiction things. You know, gee, I can see when the dog needs to go out for a walk based on the way the dog is acting. It's, he's got a different pattern of life now near the door, you know, and maybe we can have a robot take them outside, you know, and so you can, you can easily see how, how this, this can get into other industries and really drive the economy. All right. And uh, Richard, there's a lot of aspects of data, the thematic, the semantic, the temporal. I mean, this is all a whole new world relative to just a few years ago when you had structured databases and SQL queries, and that was pretty much how you got your answers to things, which compared to what we're talking about now, wasn't much answer at all. So, Tom, I agree 100%. Uh, Duncan, I've mentioned it, and, and Mark has as well. The whole concept now is I don't want to query data anymore. I want data to give me information directly. I want data in motion. And, and we gave the example earlier with the Google uh, Maps. Notice I didn't ask for a better route. It immediately populated my screen with a route. It actually will gray an area and say one minute slower, 10 minutes faster. It will start automatically pushing information to me to make a decision with an application that knows my goal is to go from one place to another place in the shortest period of time. So being able to fuse data and integrate across multiple platforms, like you said, cross domain. Right now, the solutions that we're developing are are truly algorithm-based. We are trying to create the way the mind today fuses information. IBM Watson is the, is the great example of being able to use algorithms to start putting this cross-domain solution. If you want to go win Jeopardy, you can't just know a little bit about uh, one thing. You've got to know modern music all the way down to uh, when the first telescope was invented. And, and being able to fuse that for right at the moment for the question and even maintain a discussion like we're having right now is a very complicated uh, set of uh, abilities. Never could be done. And yet it is. Watson would never win the first chess tournament against a grandmaster. It did. It could never win Jeopardy because it was too much of a cross-domain solution. It did. So you're seeing over and over, and now the ability to not only use Hadoop and MapReduce, but devices that are in industry today, uh, one of the, the tools that are used today in industry, I can put 93 terabytes, 93 terabytes into persistent memory and hold it. I can draw out a MapReduce uh, data marts and do immediate cross-sectional analysis. This is an unprecedented level and not have to use a Watson mainframe, but use a normal industry set of processors, a unique processor uh, to hold that amount of, of data in persistent memory. It, it is just phenomenal what's out there right now. So, so you really do see it. You do have to represent data in, in terms of as you ingest it, you want to immediately uh, uh, start making it better data so that I have an idea of what it does it mean. Uh, what space and time did this occur in? And if the data doesn't have that information, I need to enhance the data. I'll, I actually will put information into data. And then finally, I need to be able to reduce the scale. When we're dealing uh, in cyber, you know, you're talking about an analyst that has to look at 3 million events an hour because that's the, the rate that cyber is moving. And then they have to make a split-level decision. They can't do that in near real time. The machine's got to say, of these 3 million events, these six are really important. Focus on these six, and we'll take care of the others. How did that algorithm get generated? Oh, it got generated by lots of people saying, hey, here's how I do go through the 3 million events. Here's what I throw away immediately. Oh, this is just noise, okay? But we never throw noise away anymore. We used to throw it away. Now we find out that there's even information in noise. So long, long answer to a short question. Sure. Well, are there COT products that are anywhere near this, or is everything custom developed? For us, um, there are COTS products that lo- we look into to assist. Um, but for the most part, I think we're working um, with industry and with academia to try to develop most of these analytics um, that uh, nobody's, I guess nobody's needed an, an analytic that can uh, pick out a car from an overhead imagery before. So, um, so yeah, most of, it's, most of it's in-house or developed with industry and academia. It all becomes apps eventually, I guess, <laughs> for yeah. all of us. And Mark, what's your view on the, the, the scaling up of what you can get out of, out of uh, data? And do you have a pathway there? 
Right. So we're, <clears throat> we're using a mixture of COTS products, for example, our mapping, which we do host in the cloud uh, for scalability and for other reasons, um, and internally developed um, analysis tools. So I want to talk about something that Richard uh, mentioned, which is the, the cross-domain aspect of it. Uh, we've created, for example, maps that are a little bit like OpenStreetMaps, but it's the energy infrastructure grid for the U.S. So all the plants, all the mines, the, the, the electricity grid, um, refineries, et cetera. And does that include transmission uh, facilities? In, in, in some cases, mm-hmm. so, such as pi- pipelines. So mm-hmm. there, there's, and then we've, uh, in terms of cross-domain, uh, we've actually, since we've, once we have this up, we're able to combine this, for example, with NOAA information. So we have real-time uh, maps in hurricane season of where the hurricane cone is likely to head and what it might impact. And that's been very well received by you know, both the, uh, the first responders and by uh, the analysts in Wall Street, et cetera. Um, and uh, so we're also expanding that laterally, too. Um, there's currently a memorandum of, uh, of understanding between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada to try to expand some key map layers to actually provide a North American view of the energy infrastructure. Um, but this also brings up the, the issue that as you aggregate to various levels, uh, what is the security? Um, so we've had to go through, you know, when we put up these maps, um, a lot of questions about what we can show. And uh, sometimes it can be challenging in government, to be honest, to find out who is the definitive authority um, and who says that, you know, post, post 9-11 world, it's okay to show this, this information. It took a little while, but I, th- I think we're there. But it's been, you know, it's been an interesting journey. I mean, it's sort of a uh, revved up version of the old DOD conundrum that a single point of information may not tell the enemy anything, but aggregated non-classified information adds up to something that could give the enemy information that you wouldn't want it to have. And so this seems to be happening in other domains in government then. You're seeing this over and over and over again of being able to not only combine data, but combine data in near real time. And, and so even though some of the large frameworks like Hadoop and MapReduce cannot do transactional analysis, in other words, I want to know right now, do I let Richard break iron on the plane for custom and border protection? MapReduce will be able to be brought into a tool that industry now provides of hosting 93 terabytes and comparing his behavior in the last day, 24 hours, 48, or even with what we know about him historically and get you a cot solution of delivering this. Again, when you fuse data like this, as Mark has discussed and as uh, Duncan's discussed, you start to, to hit the same issue you just described. When do I cross a boundary of having created data where I'm going to make an actionable decision. So everything we're talking about, this huge difference in data in my mind today is data is now in motion. It's in motion in a way we never envisioned. And now we make real decisions on it. Some are very positive. We've used the the example of Google over and over and again. Some will be positive if we prevent a terrorist from getting onto a plane. So that's a good news. But what if we prevent the private citizen that should have gotten on the plane that we've prevented because of some either work that we're doing on the algorithm or maybe we have a bad data stream that has given us some bad data sets. So all these things have got to be worked out as we go forward on some of those issues. I think one of the most important things that I'm trying to to, uh, talk to about the intelligence community is not only do we need to understand the classification of data, we need to understand the confidence level associated with data. The intelligence community should deal with no data that doesn't have both a classification and a confidence level associated with it, just for the reasons you're talking about. Because if if a certain set of data comes in and it looks like, well, this person's bad, but we have a 60% confidence level, you need to check harder. You need to make sure that you're not going to do something horrendously wrong. Because we've made some mistakes in the past based on evidence that was a pretty good guess. But then when we looked at it, it's like, wow, you know, we had a 60% confidence level in that when the analyst put it forward. And well, you know, people got hurt. And we don't want to do that. Yeah, and, and I honestly think what Duncan just said is what we're finding with data sets are you need both pedigree and confidence level. So a pedigree is, it's a government source. I'm actually pulling data from the Department of Energy on their grid, but you know, they haven't completed some of the work in Canada and and Mexico yet. So pedigree is great, but the confidence level is not there yet. Confidence level, when I get data from machines, I'm very, very excited about machine data because it's the machines telling me fact. If it's a survey, eh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit, the pedigree could still be good. It's a government survey instituted by the census, but everybody has an opinion on how they want to interpret the question and answer, so the confidence level might be a little bit different. All of these absolutely have to be. You will often always need a human in the loop before you make an action, and this is the part I come back to over and over. In cyber, 
an event that we found, yep, we had a blacklist actor. They had penetrated a DOD network. Yep, there was some exfiltration mm -hmm. of data going on. Oh, we want to block that. We want to stop that. Well, time out here. NSA, a lot of other intelligent community, they could have set this up as a honeypot. They might have been looking for this blacklist actor for 12 months. They finally found him. They have him coming in. They have him going exactly where they want. You just blocked him. You know what you just sent that signal to? That blacklister goes, hides again, and comes back up somewhere else. So you, you can have cyber fracticide. You need to make sure that across the domain communities that we talk about how we're going to put procedures in place sure. when we find information from big data. And, Duncan, isn't there also the issue of that even people at different classification levels within the agency could inadvertently combine things because this is a data sharing environment with yes. eyesight and suddenly find themselves in possession of something that under strict policy they wouldn't ordinarily have or shouldn't have. That's what we have to be very careful with that, right? That's why the classification and pedigree is important, but also building procedures or algorithms that will give you a derived classification in an automatic way. We don't have that now. Um, right now, you know, it takes a classification authority, a person who says, this is secret, this is top secret, this is unclassified. And, uh, and as far as I know, there's nothing automated to do that. All right. Well, uh, lots of questions, lots of answers. We could go on for a long time, but I think we have to end it here today. I want to thank today's guests. Uh, Duncan McCarthy is the Technical Executive at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's InnoVision Directorate. And Mark Elbert is the Director of the Office of Web Management at the Energy Information Administration. And Richard Brakeiron, the Senior Director of Cyber Solutions at Vion Corporation. I'm Tom Temin, Federal News Radio, 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. On behalf of Vion Corporation, thank you for joining our discussion. We'll have the archive from this session available shortly, and a link will be sent to you to share with your colleagues. Those of you who requested a training certificate will receive an email with download instructions immediately following the webinar. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.